as we step into this, this new year, uh, we are blessed by so many things in our lives and um, we enter a new season, the season of Epiphany. And so I hope that this season which will shed light and shine light on us uh, may be a true blessing, this, this Epiphany. Let us join together in prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our salvation. Amen. Jesus appears. He just appears. Nothing is said about all of the years and all that happened in his life since his birth, since his infancy. If we're counting on Matthew in his gospel to fill in the blanks of 30 years, we shouldn't hold our breath. Blue is not our best look, unless, of course, we're avatars from the planet Pandora. Then blue looks good. No, Jesus simply appears. For 30 years, he's waited. He's waited on the sidelines in a small town in the hills of Galilee named Nazareth. All this time, he has been working in the carpenter's shop and performing the duties of an oldest son in a growing Jewish peasant family. He's been waiting, knowing that the success of his mission, or any mission for that matter, is all about timing, and his time is yet to be. He has been waiting for the hour to come, for the summons, sound, and finally, when John the baptizer appears in the desert at the river, Jesus knows that the time for appearing has arrived. Well, how does he know this? How does he know that this is the time to come forward to John at the river? How does he know that this is the time to step into the water for the repentance of sins? Simply this, never in all of history that has been the history of the Jews have the Jews ever submitted to be baptized? This whole concept was inconceivable. Baptism was used only by the Jews when others came into their faith. Either they came from another faith or no faith at all. It was literally beyond belief for any member of the chosen people, any son of Abraham, anyone connected to the lineage of King David to ever need to be baptized. So baptism was for sinners, not those who had been chosen. It was saved for those who recognized that they wanted to be a part of something new, who submitted to this act to clean up their lives, to confess, to be forgiven, to turn everything around to the power of God's Spirit, and to be present in the water so that the water could wash away their sins. But that wasn't the Jews of the first century. This national movement of Jews coming out into the desert from the cities, from the towns, from the countryside, comes into the waters of the Jordan beside John in a whole new way. It's like a revival within the faith, right? This is a very significant thing. Here they come. They come to confess their sins. They come to be cleansed by water. They come to receive the Holy Spirit. They come to be a part of something new something new in the history of Judaism. And Jesus knows this is the moment. This is where his coming out party will be. He will head to the desert, to the Jordan, and he does. And John cannot believe his eyes. Really? Jesus is in front of me? Jesus is in front of me asking for me to baptize him? Do you get this? I totally, I totally get this. The one whom John has been proclaiming as greater than himself, the one that we're all supposed to be waiting for, the one who is supposed to come to clear up everything, is now in front of John. Put yourself in John's place. John has been a vessel of God's love and mercy. He has stepped out on faith to bring a whole new movement about, this new, new movement of living and loving, of turning, to something new and beautiful, to come to the Messiah, to the Son of God, and now the Messiah is literally inches away from his face. How can this be? 
How can the chosen one be baptized? He is sinless, he is pure, and he's asking to get what everybody else gets? And then Jesus speaks these beautiful, beautiful words. We hear his voice for the first time in the gospel. He says this, let it happen now. Let it happen now. He gracefully lets John go. He releases him from all of his anxiety, all of his reservations, and he shows him that grace abounds in all the moments that follow. John is humbled and blown away by this moment. All the flames of fire we associate with John, well, they're doused by the presence of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit. For now, John simply baptizes Jesus. But what happens next proves that John was right. When Jesus comes out of the water, all heaven breaks loose. As one translation says, bang, the heavens open, the breath of, come, breath of God comes down and is seen like a dove, and God speaks and she says, this is my son, my beloved in whom I am well pleased. And her voice sounds like Marty Worth. <laughs> I've always believed that was true. Jerry, you too, say yes, just say yes, please, Jerry. Thank you, Marty. <laughs> Yes, that's right. She says it. The voice of God, according to Matthew, is feminine. God speaks in a feminine voice, at least in this moment and in, any other, and in many other moments in Scripture. But for all of you who've been saying for years the voice of God is feminine, you win. The biblical interpretation lottery is yours. For all who are shocked, why don't you read your Greek and find out that it's true? Although it may have been presented incorrectly by misogynistic interpretation, perhaps, for 2,000 years, what do you think, Reverend Samuelson? It is true. God's voice is feminine. I can stop there, but there's more to say. Jesus is sent by her on a mission. She sends him forth into the desert, blessed and beloved, to set out to do his work. It is there that we will meet him again when he encounters his second conversation in the Gospels, this time with Satan. But that's another story for another Sunday. As a matter of fact, February 26th, the first Sunday of Lent. This is the first Sunday of Epiphany, so let's stay here. There's so much to unpack in this baptismal story. Jesus waiting and his timing to be just right for his first appearance. John is silent and humble. The Holy Spirit is a dove descending that is seen and felt and known, the voice of God as she offers love, blessing, and sending forth. We have grace abounding everywhere in this story of water and spirit. There are many surprises in this story, and they are all wrapped by grace. Grace surprises us all most of the time, Grace is found in the waiting of a young carpenter named Jesus, in the face of John, who meets Jesus in the water for the first time. Grace is found in the spirit gently arriving and seen like a dove descending, and Jesus emerging from the water and God speaking to him in all her glory. Grace is found, it's found in silence, and waiting and meeting face to face in the bursting forth of heaven in the shining through of light from a cloudy day, grace is found in receiving a voice of love and blessing that sounds like the voice of the woman who most has touched your life. Grace is found in stepping out of the muddy waters of our lives and stepping out to serve. Baptism is our graceful entrance into our life of faith in Christ. It splashes us and cleanses us. Some of us cover up, we see it coming. Others of us are like, bring it on, right? It lands like a dove and sends us out to serve. Today, as we renew our vows of baptism, as we step into this season of light and delight, 
as we move into this new year. Let us receive the fullness of grace in this experience and in this day. Whatever has kept us away from the love of God, let the graceful presence of God's water and spirit wash that away. Whatever anger and resentments we hang on to, may the graceful presence of God's water and spirit wash that away. Whatever we hold on to that keeps us judging others rather than loving them, let the graceful presence of God's water and spirit wash that away. And whatever belief we cling to that keeps us away from loving someone else unconditionally, let the graceful presence of God's water and spirit wash that away. In the words of Jesus to John, as they stood face to face, inches away from one another in the River Jordan. Let it happen now. Amen.